if you have visited this channel for gameplay videos and commentary about about games this is probably not the best video to be watching if that is specifically what you are after the the visuals that are currently in front of you have nothing to do with what I'm talking about right now. I have chosen them at random. At the time of recording, I don't even know what I've chosen, so that's going to be an interesting editing decision later. But, uh, no, no, this is something a little different. I'm just going to talk a little bit about my personal political opinions and my understanding of the subject matter in question. The intention is mainly, well, the intention is mainly to vent and yell into the void, but in terms of what you, the viewer, will be getting out of this, the intention is mainly for the incitement of debate and to think about the issues, to think about how we've come to the decisions that we have about the issues and whether they are in the best interests of the country and to an extent the world not sound overly dramatic but this is a, a decision for our country that affects uh, Europe and it would be foolish to think that what happens in Europe does not have impact upon the rest of the world just look at oh, dog bark in the background but uh ruins any dramatic impact I was hoping to build up with it. But no, as I said, if you want to uh, if you want to look at Europe's influence on the world, then you're on YouTube. Look at YouTube's marketing for that Article 13 uh, stuff. I'm not going to talk about that. This is, this is going to be an awkward enough topic for me to talk about as it is, because I'm well aware that I have limited knowledge and understanding of many of the issues that I am going to be attempting to talk about. So, we'll start at the very beginning, I think. If my dog will ever shut up. Shut up, Bella! <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, okay, fine. The dog's going to be barking throughout, I suspect. <laughs> so, as I said, we'll start at the beginning. There was a referendum with a very straightforward question asking the people of the United Kingdom if they would like to stay in the uh, European common market. The result, with a majority of 17.4, roughly 17.4 million people, was for the UK to stay in the common market, which then later became the EU. That is where... That was the first EU referendum, as it were. It was in 1975. It was also the first referendum the United Kingdom ever had. And was the only referendum that they had for about 36 years, um, until about 2011, where they had an unrelated referendum on an alternative voting system that didn't pass. And then the third referendum that came along, or the second EU referendum that came along, was in 2016... It was an in-out vote again, and this time, 17.4 million people, again, rounding, 17.4 million people voted to leave the EU. 16 million people, thereabout, voted to stay in the EU, and the end result of that vote was a 52-48 split. If again you're rounding to the nearest, the nearest numbers. But to all intents and purposes, it was a 50 50 split. If someone were to cut, cut you 52% of a cake and you were to say they've given me half a cake, you'd have to be an absolute tosser to then argue about that 2% difference. But, but as I said, in democratic terms, it was still a victory for leave. As I said, in practical terms, it was a 50 50 split. Because of that decision, that majority, the government of the United Kingdom proceeded to 
well, after they changed half the leaders, which was uh, kind of ironic, given that a lot of people were complaining about the EU being representatives that were undemocratically elected. And then the referendum comes along, and all the people who were democratically elected stepped down, and a bunch of undemocratically elected people stepped in. But that's, uh, that was just an amusing side, and it's just that's just how politics work. We uh, in this country, you don't vote for um, a person; you vote for a party. So it wasn't the parties that changed; it was just the people at the uh, at the head. I will admit that my understanding of how the EU voting system works about who uh, is in charge there is next to nothing. I. <laughs> I know where the limits of my knowledge are, and 90% of what the EU does is beyond <laughs> beyond my level of understanding. But yes, I was saying, so because of the 2016 referendum, the UK Parliament decided that they would honour that referendum, because that is kind of what they're politically <laughs> incentivized to do, um, and to in- invoke Article 50 which is the EU's way of leaving the EU, basically. That then took place in the, I think it was the following March. If you're wondering why I seem to have specific information about the 1975... Sorry, my computer's making noise of me. Um, If you're wondering why I have specific knowledge about the 1975 referendum and not about specific dates involving the Brexit process, I have that first referendum's Wikipedia page up at the side, so I could get these these facts, because I didn't want to get too much of them wrong. It's weird that I would ca- not care about getting the Brexit information wrong, but that's uh, that's how my brain decided to work today, I think. But yeah, so in, in the following March, Article 50 was invoked, which then gave us the two years to come up with a deal with which we could then leave the EU, or alternatively, not have any deal at all, and after that two-year period, we would then leave without a deal. That is, in the very basic level, the difference between a hard and soft Brexit. So a hard Brexit is a complete cut-off, no deal. Again, this is an over- I know I'm aware this is an oversimplification, but it's um, such a complicated issue that for the sake of brevity, and again because of my limited understanding of these complicated issues, we we will simplify it down to a hard Brexit was is leaving with the EU. A hard Brexit is leaving the EU with no deal. A soft Brexit is leaving the EU with some form of deal. So, as that two-year period has now come to an end, we are um, at the time of recording, only a handful of days away from the what was the two-year deadline of the invocation of Article 50. Uh, there has since been an extension. We'll get to that in a little bit. So two years passed, and in that time, the UK Parliament put together a uh, a board of uh, EU negotiators. They went to the EU and they worked long and hard to try and get a deal put together. Now, for the first year of that two years, they didn't seem to achieve very much, but it's very hard to dismiss all of the work that would have gone on behind the scenes. There's obviously lots of very technical stuff that needs to go on that we will probably never know about because the specifics of the negotiation will always be probably beyond our access. We will only ever really see and ever really need to know about the results that have come from it. And the end result is a deal that, by all accounts, is incredibly unpopular. It has issues with the Irish border of Northern Ireland and Mainland Ireland. In as much as those two countries, uh, well, they are two separate countries, one's part of the UK and one is not, those two countries had, it's called the Troubles, they didn't get on very well for a very long time, (laughs) to put it mildly, but they came to something known as the Good Friday Agreement, and part of that agreement involved having no hard border 
between Northern and Mainland Ireland. Unfortunately, with the UK leaving the EU, it immediately became exceedingly difficult to not have a hard border at, well, the border of Northern Ireland. The issue being that any company that would have a benefit to setting itself up in the EU and then trading in the UK would just be able to go straight across that border and we'd have no means of stopping them. Uh, so they created something in this deal called the Irish Backstop and no one's happy with it because it is a temporary solution to a permanent problem. And there is nothing in that deal, as far as I'm aware, that puts a time limit on it or comes up with any alternative solutions for later in, um, in, as time goes on. And people, that, that's the biggest problem, as far as I'm aware, with this, this deal. As such, it has been taken to Parliament several times. Parliament has looked at the deal. And all, all the EU has signed off on the deal. All the other 27 or whatever it is countries have looked at the deal and gone, yes, we're happy with this. They're all ready to go. The EU is, is set. Fortunately, our Parliament has looked at this deal upon multiple occasions with very little change to uh, the terminology or the issues involved and at every opportunity has voted against selecting this deal. They then have also voted against on multiple occasions leaving the EU without a deal. It is generally accepted from an economic standpoint that leaving the EU without a deal would be a disaster. That it would be the worst possible choice we could make. Not to say there are, it doesn't have its supporters, but in, generally speaking, it is considered a bad idea to try and leave the EU with no deal. Because all that means is we'd then need to make a bunch of deals, but we would have nothing in the interim. Whereas at least leaving with a deal, in future, I see there's, as far as I'm aware, there's no reason those deals couldn't be renegotiated at some point. But... Let's, uh, let's just stick with what we know for this moment. We can talk about hypotheticals all day long. <laughs> so, we've got this deal. Nobody likes it. The EU are happy enough with it that they're willing to sign off on it. But we weren't, able, we weren't going to get it through in time for the two-year deadline. As such, Theresa May has gone to the EU and said... Pretty please, can you get us a bit more time to sort this stuff out? The EU has said, sort of. They've definitely given us an extension. They've said you can have more time, that's fine. And then they've given us two new deadlines to work from. The first deadline is the shorter deadline, ironically, which is basically saying you have until this date to vote on the New Deal, and if that vote is against the deal once more, you have until this shorter deadline to tell us what you want to do. Now, presumably at that point, we could then petition for a new extension. But the EU are unlikely to give us any more at time without a damn good reason. We will get to that in a bit. The other deadline is the longer one. Uh, and that's basically saying that if Parliament is to agree to this deal, you've got until this new date. And that's basically for paperwork reasons. It'll So all the legislation can be put into place and there's still plenty of time to get uh, to leave the EU with the deal. So popping back to that shorter deadline again. If Parliament once again votes against leaving the EU with Theresa May's deal, as I believe they are debating at the moment. I don't know what the results of that are yet, though there may be some new information between my recording and the video actually going up, because that is, is the nature of Brexit. It is in a sort of constant flux, but doesn't actually seem to be going anywhere, which is bizarre. But the options are very limited as to what we could ask, say to the EU, these are the reasons we need more time. Now, it could be that Theresa May goes back and says they voted down the deal, but we actually know what we need to change in the deal 
or to get them to accept it, if you would just renegotiate this one little section of it, we can get that sorted, and then Parliament can agree, we can get going. If she actually comes forward with a plan like that, good chance the EU might say, yeah, sure, we can work with that, here's a new extension. If she comes forward and says, okay, Parliament aren't best pleased with this deal, they want to renegotiate the whole thing, the EU are just going to tell us to stuff it and deal with it. That is what happens when you put yourself in an antagonistic position against 27 other countries. They are going to do what is best for them, which would be taking the deal that we've got. It is better for the EU for us to leave with a deal than it is for us to leave without. That is true of both parties. Leaving with a deal is the preferential situation, regardless of which side you stand, in the EU or out of it. But the EU will suffer less from us leaving without a deal than the UK will. So, if we turn up and say we want to renegotiate the entire thing, the EU will just say, right, okay, no, deal with it. We'll take the hit of you leaving without a deal. We will somehow manage. We'll work together because that's what the EU does. It's a team game <laughs> and we've decided we want to try and play solo against them. So the other options that even Theresa May could come forward with is saying something along the lines of we'd like more time because we've decided that uh, we need a general election because this parliament isn't working. Now I suspect she wouldn't be the one to suggest this as an option. This would probably be um, someone like Jeremy Corbyn putting forward a vote of no confidence and that vote of no confidence getting, getting approved, basically. Uh, he has put one forward before. It... It wasn't approved. I'm not sure what the technical term for it would be, but essentially put forward a vote of no confidence in Theresa May and people still stood behind her and said, no, she's she's doing the best job she can. And to be perfectly honest, I think Theresa May does get a lot of stick for problems that she has had no control over whatsoever. Not to say that she hasn't made some phenomenal mistakes, but she was in the impossible situation of trying to make the UK leaving the EU work. And it's not to say that it couldn't be done, but it is a Im almost impossible thing to try and do. There was there was all of the things that were being pushed as the the reasons that we could manage on our own without the EU were they've been described as unicorns. It was just an a fantasy that we would ever be able to achieve these things. A lot of the leave campaign seem to be talking about us somehow leaving the EU but maintaining all the benefits that we would have by staying in the EU which is just impossible there's no way that was ever going to happen uh, in much the same way as the famous red buses driving around London saying we send the EU 50 million pounds or whatever it was uh, let's spend that on the NHS instead a brilliant idea and if you know that was in any way feasible there's a good chance that nobody would stand against it. Unfortunately, the numbers were wrong, and even if the numbers were right, it was never going to happen. On the morning after the referendum came through, everybody who was somebody in the Leave campaign just went, ah, um, yeah, yeah I, I don't know who said that, £50 million going to the NHS thing, but it wasn't me, and yeah, it was, it was infeasible. I don't know why anyone was ever saying that. Which is great, but you should have been going against it before the referendum, not the day after you got the result you wanted. Now, I'm well aware that this sounds very bitter. It sounds like me complaining about not getting the result I wanted. We will get to that shortly. I'm well aware that we're 20-odd minutes into this and I haven't really got anywhere yet. I've just been explaining the backstory of Brexit with a admittedly very lopsided view of it. So, let's just take a moment to discuss the two main points about Brexit. The biggest argument for leaving the EU and the biggest argument for remaining in the EU. Now obviously I will talk about remaining in it first because that is the position I personally hold. I will do my utmost to present the other view in a, a balanced fashion but I will, I'm announcing my bias now. I'm letting you know that that's the situation I'm going to be in and I'll do my best but if there is something inaccurate or unfavourable about the way it is presented, you, you can understand that it's where it's coming from. So, the main argument for remaining in the EU was that the UK would be economically better off 
by staying in the EU than it would by leaving it. This was the popular opinion of experts. Experts Michael Gove was very quick to assume the people didn't want to hear about, and apparently he was correct. Again, 17.4 million people were happy to leave the EU despite something like 90% of the economists who were asked saying that it would be financially inadvisable. Now, some of them may have been assuming the worst, I'd say, that they looked at the possible outcomes and went, well, we stay in the EU, the worst case scenario is X. If we leave the EU, the worst case scenario is X minus 100. But I'm not an economist. I can't speak for where they got their data from or what their data was or what their projections came from. All I can say is that at the end of the day, the majority of the economists who were asked for their official opinions upon leaving the EU advised against it. Now, the main argument for leaving the EU was that, and it's a perfectly understandable one, but the argument was that the British laws should be decided by the British and not by Brussels. And that is a perfectly reasonable standpoint to have, that the rules of this country should be made by the people who live in it and by the people who have been elected by the people who live in it, and that is where our rules should come from. The problem is, it assumes that the European Union works against British decisions, and that rules in Britain were being made against the will of the British politicians who were working in the EU, except that in 97% of the cases of EU votes, Britain was on the winning side of it. I apologise if I'm fudging those numbers slightly, but it is in the rough ballpark that the number of times we were on the winning side of a debate and vote in the EU overwhelmingly outnumbered the times that we weren't. And that's over a you know, 40-year period. But sort of the half a decade that we were in... <laughs> half a decade? Half a century. <laughs> the half century we were in the EU, we won significantly more times than we lost. Other issues that were brought up in terms of leaving the EU were border control issues, dis the disagreements with the concept of free movement across the EU. They felt that would bring in far too much immigration, uh, more than the country could, could handle. Again, not an unreasonable standpoint to have in terms of what the, the country is able to deal with. Unfortunately, shortly before the... Uh, referendum, the then Prime Minister David Cameron, before he'd actually made his decision about, or his official decision, about which side of the referendum he was going to support, leave or remain, he went over to the EU. They were aware that the UK was considering leaving, uh, considering leaving, though this was, as I said, before the referendum, so there was nothing set in stone. They just were aware that it was a concern. And so David Cameron went over to the EU and made some negotiations. And part of those negotiations did involve control of the UK borders. Now, I'm well aware that those were not... They, they weren't set in stone. There was every possibility that the EU could later on revoke the, the special privileges that the UK seemed to be getting. Because we got a lot of stuff from the EU that other countries weren't getting. They did not want us to leave. And they, they were quite happy to give us a lot of the things we asked for in terms of not being forced to join the euro, in terms of, you know, I said, controlling our borders, things like that. Um, so we, we got a lot of things in our favour from the EU. And that's, that position is not one we will ever be able to attain again. Um, even if, by some miracle, Article 50 were to be revoked we've lost that element of trust, we've lost that soft power that we would have had in the EU, because they, they can't trust that we won't, at some point again, try and leave and screw everything up again. So the the argument for immigration you sort of had a hurdle in the fact that, you know, we had an agreement to control the immigration that came into our country. Now, unfortunately, this part of where I will be discussing the Leave campaign is where my bias is going to shine most strongly, most strongly, 
I said most strongest. That's not that's not how you sentence. And here's where my bias are going to show the most strongly, because for all the sound arguments that the Leave campaign may have, they have a very bad habit of their mouthpieces being terrible for the sort of PR campaign. The loudest voice for the United Kingdom leaving the EU was, of course, uh, UKIP, and specifically Nigel Farage, who is well-renowned for being a horrible little man, being incredibly ignorant about what he says and the opinions that he has. Uh, this is a man who stood up in a European uh, parliament and yelled at everyone in there, no one knew who they were, and that they'd never worked a proper job in their lives. Unfortunately, in the very... Because um, it was being recorded at the time, in the very shot you had of him making this assertion that none of them had worked uh, a honest job in their lives, um, all the people in that shot were doctors and lawyers and electrical engineers and all sorts of legitimately, undisputably hard-working people who had later moved into politics. So the fact that he had no idea who they were doesn't mean that nobody had no idea who they were. So he, uh, Nigel Farage did the Leave campaign no favours by being in any way associated with it. Um, other mouthpieces, as I referred to earlier, <laughs> involved Boris Johnson, who has his moments of being likeable, but for the most part is a gibbering moron and has very bizarre ideas about pretty much anything he starts talking about. And to to my knowledge, the third biggest voice in favour of leaving the European Union was Michael Gove, a man whose sole purpose in life seems to be to make a great big smelly mess of everything that he gets involved with. The man is a fool and a moron <laughs> and always seems to be given jobs that he has no qualifications to do and no understanding of how to do them. This is a man who managed to completely ruin not only his own but Boris Johnson's chart at becoming Prime Minister simply by attempting to become Prime Minister. <laughs> if you're unfamiliar, when uh, the, the 2016 referendum went through, the results came out, David Cameron, who had been uh, leading the Leave, uh, sorry, he had been leading the Remain campaign, quite rightly said, if this is the way the country is going, then clearly I am not in touch with the will of the people, and it is my then obligation that I should step down from this role, and someone more suited should step up. So Boris Johnson was considered for a long time, while that, uh, while the, the rearrangement of uh, who was being Prime Minister was taking place, it was perceived for a long time that Boris Johnson was the most likely candidate. It required, however, backing from Michael Gove, who at the last minute decided instead to put himself forward as a candidate. This lack of support caused uh, Boris Johnson to step down from his candidacy, candid candidacy. That was harder to say than it should have been. His candidacy. And because it was then perceived that Michael Gove had effectively stabbed Boris Johnson in the back, he didn't get any support for his attempt to become Prime Minister, so he was then forced to step down, leading to Theresa May then basically being at that point the only candidate left. <laughs> so she sort of won by default, as it were, and was given this horrible job of trying to make Brexit work. And, as I said, three years later, here we are. Brexit isn't working. So, I spoke earlier about the options Theresa May could go forward to the EU with. Now, as I said, the first one was with, uh, we want to renegotiate an aspect which has a possibility of working. The second was we've got no idea what we're doing, can renegotiate the whole thing, which was unlikely to succeed. The third option was something political going on. Now, the example I gave was a general election or a vote of confidence or some change in leadership. The other possible option that would very likely result in 
an EU extension was if she had decided or had been pressured into another EU referendum. The People's Vote movement, as it is uh, trending on Twitter, I believe. The idea being that now we actually have knowledge of what the options are, rather than dealing with the hypotheticals and the straight-up lies that were being <laughs> paraded around at the time of the referendum. Now people actually have knowledge of what those options realistically are, that we can leave the EU with the deal that Theresa May has worked to put forward, a deal that, once it was put forward to Parliament, before they even had a chance to vote, all of the people who had been involved with it immediately stepped down from their positions as having anything to do with it, which is shows exactly how unpopular this uh, this deal was, that the people who wrote it didn't want anything to do with it. So option one of this referendum would be, or could be, take the deal. Option two could be leave with no deal. And the third option is to remain in the EU, to revoke Article 50. This is a uh, the option, fairly obviously, by the, the context of the rest of this, uh, this video, that I am the most in favour of. I believe that. Even now, staying in the EU would be more beneficial to the UK than attempting to leave it, both with the deal we've got and definitely if we try and leave without a deal. Unfortunately, this idea of another referendum does get a lot of opposition. A lot of the opposition being, well, if we have another referendum, then we'll have to have another one after that and another one after that and we'll have a never endum which is obviously gibberish because the only reason to have a referendum would be because the situation has changed. Hence the reason why we had a referendum saying, shall we stay in the EU, followed by another one 36 years later saying, shall we stay in the EU? The situation around what that meant had changed. And while it's only been three years, the situation has changed. We actually do have knowledge of what being in and not being in the EU now means. We may not understand it all, but we're in a better position now than we were. The weird thing is, it's having a referendum, Theresa May could set it up in a way she could not possibly lose. If she puts forward option A as we leave with her deal, and option B as we stay in the EU. There is no possible way she can fail with that, with that referendum. Unlike David Cameron, who had a stay in the EU and win, leave the EU and fail option. In terms of his political standing, as it were, obviously it went against his <laughs> the way he thought it was going to go, so he stepped down. But as far as Theresa May is concerned, if the public decide they do still want to leave the EU with her deal, that would garner the support she would need for Parliament to push through this deal. Because as I said, Parliament's not fond of it, but if the people are saying we'll take that over nothing, then it would be... Well, under the same vein, it would have been foolish of... Uh, not foolish, that's the wrong word. It would have been unwise for Parliament to have gone against the 2016 referendum, it would be unwise for Parliament to go against the decision of the latest one, if the latest one were to say take Mrs May's deal. So, if people still want to leave the EU, it's a victory for Theresa May. If people, however, and this is a way I personally believe is more likely, the populace said no, let's stay in the EU instead, that is still a victory for Theresa May, because she doesn't have to deal with Brexit anymore. The problem has gone away of its own accord. The Article 50 can be revoked. The status quo can more or less be restored. I know, as I said, there'd be a trust issue <laughs> with the EU, but she would still have effectively won. Now, the, the problem is that were she to announce another referendum, it would be a, a political failure in terms of 
from her personal standpoint. It would be an, ad- an admission, I should say, of political failure. She would effectively be saying, so I tried this whole Brexit thing, it hasn't really worked out, do you maybe want to rethink that? And from a political standpoint, I completely understand why she would be reluctant to put that forward as an idea. A politician's primary goal is re-election. It's not necessarily to stand for an area, to be representative. If they're not re-elected, they don't have a job, for the most part. So their primary goal is self-motivated self-interest, which we all knew. (laughs) And if anyone disagreed, then... Yeah. Well, let, let's not be mean about people. Let's try, well, I am being mean about people, of course. I am. <laughs> You've heard my jabberings. But, uh, but yeah, let, let's let's push that aside just for a moment. I'm well aware that I'm basically stealing near rambly shtick and rambling along about whatever happens to have taken my <laughs> my attention at that moment. So yes, as I said, it would have been it would be perceived as a personal political failure for her to put forward another referendum. The biggest argument I have for another referendum, as I've said, I, I personally believe that if it were to go forward, that people would, this time, vote to stay in the EU. But let's put that aside for a moment. The main driving force behind Brexit has never been that Brexit is a good idea. As we've said before it started, the majority of the experts were saying Brexit would be fundamentally flawed in terms of, of how our economic standing would, would exist. Um, as is demonstrated by that immediately after the results of the referendum came through, the value of the pound dropped straight into the toilet and has never really recovered. Admittedly, it's only been three years, but it was a big drop uh, directly as a result of the, the referendum results. And there have been several large companies who, in the past three years, have made decisions to move to other parts of the world with the businesses, including Dyson, despite the fact that the CEO and founder of Dyson was a very heavy uh, Leave supporter, and is insistent that it has nothing to do with with Brexit, that uh, his company is moving to Singapore or wherever it was. It was just the better financial interests of his company, which makes perfect sense because Brexit has effectively caused the financial future of our country to be completely a complete unknown, whereas people can be fairly sure Singapore aren't going to be leaving the European Union anytime soon. So you can say it's not related all you want. But unfortunately just because you say it isn't related doesn't mean it isn't. As you said, it made more financial sense for your company to be in a more financially stable country, and Brexit has not resulted in financial stability in the near future. Uh, Nissan was another one. They had made a contract to build a whole bunch of X-Trails in their country, and now they're not doing that anymore. And they will say, because it makes more financial sense for us to make it in our own country, or in the other countries across the world, such as, let's say, the if they've got a plant in France... It would make more sense for them to build cars in France. Oh, well, it has nothing to do with Brexit. It's nothing to do with the fact that if we were to build cars in the EU, it would be easier to trade with the EU because the EU knows what it's doing with the EU. But yeah, I'm sure there's, there's no connection. No connection there whatsoever. Nothing to do with the fact that they know what the Japanese trade deal is with the European Union countries and have no idea what the British deals are going to be with the EU, or with Japan, for that matter. But yes, I'm sure those things are not in any way, shape or form connected, because that's what the spokespeople said. That's what they said. That's what Nissan said. It wasn't connected. That's what Dyson said. It wasn't connected. But let's face facts. Brexit is such a big issue that it definitely has an effect. It may not have been... You're not, maybe not be leaving because of Brexit specifically... But the results that Brexit has caused have influenced why you're leaving. And you have every right to do what is in the best interest of your company. That makes perfect sense. I can't fault you for wanting to leave 
because it makes financial sense to work in countries that know what they're doing. Yeah, as I said, it was just ironic that Dyson was one of the first companies to bugger off on account of, as I said, the head of Dyson being such a heavy leave supporter. Anyway, getting a bit off topic, as I was saying, the main driving force behind Brexit has been that it is the, and I quote, will of the people. Now, if it is still the will of the people, then it is the duty of our elected representatives to perform their duty and leave the European Union in whatever they deem to be the best fashion. Whether that be to take Theresa May's deal, whether that to be to leave with no deal, whether that to be to somehow negotiate, uh, renegotiate a new one. But that is if the will of the people remains unchanged after three years and after new information about what that involves has come forward. If the will of the people, however, as I believe it has, personally, if the will of the people has changed to wishing to remain in the European Union, then by the very nature of what drove Brexit in the first place, there is a moral obligation to follow through with the will of the people and to revoke Article 50 while there is still the option to do so. Now, the analogy I would give for this particular situation is, imagine you were the leader of a group of, let's say, ten people. And you decided you wanted to go out for a meal. So you ask the group, what do you want to eat? And a few people pipe up and go, oh, oh, there's this really great Indian restaurant about ten miles down the road. If we just walk down there, it'll take us a while, but if we walk down there, we can get fantastic food, the best damn thing you've ever eaten in your life. Let's do that. And then someone else pipes up and goes, it's a long way to go. And, you know, I've had some pretty good food before. Couldn't we just, you know, stay here and just have some sandwiches instead? May not be the best food in the universe, but we know we know what we can get with the sandwiches. So you ask the group and you end up with a 6-4 divide, which is a significantly bigger divide than the Brexit vote would have got. But let's just go with it for now. <laughs> Do the 6-4 divide, and the 6 say, we want to go try this Indian food. So, as the leader, you go, right, well, you put it to the group. The group has said, they want Indian food, we'll go get Indian food. So you walk down the road, and several hours later, because I said it was 10 miles away, that's quite a walk, particularly with a group of 10 people. You walk down the road, you get there, and you get to the windows of this Indian restaurant. You look through the windows, and... It's completely filthy. Just mess everywhere. You can see there's rats in the kitchen. You can see the wait staff have all got smallpox. It's just a horrible idea. You're looking at this. If you're at that point, seeing how terrible this, this restaurant is, it would be wrong of you to turn to those ten people and say, yes, I can see this is a bad idea, but six of you said we wanted to do this, so everybody get in the restaurant. We're going to have us some damn Indian food. You would turn to them and you'd say, Really, guys, are you sure? You sure this is what you want? Because there's a taxi right here. We could just go home and get those sandwiches. We know what we've got in the fridge. I mean, a cheese sandwich is not an Indian takeaway, but at least it's not rat crap and smallpox. It you sure you don't want to get back in the car? Now, I believe the UK population is in very much the same situation. We were asked three years ago, what do you want to do? And we got a 50-50 split saying some we want to leave and we want to stay. And that 2% margin made the difference. If that 2% margin has expanded or remained the same, then, fine. I, I can accept that it is still the will of the people, as it were. It may not be my personal will, but majority rule. That's how these things work. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. 
that also goes the other way. A 2% margin is basically nothing. They could have done that referendum the next day and it could very easily have gone the exact opposite way. A 2% flux would be well within expectations. Which is part of the reason why um, one of the following um, petitions that came up on the website was that uh, referendum should be declared void if there wasn't a 60% majority, because that, that 10% is unlikely to, to change. So 2 or 3% might, 10 is unlikely. Now, the other factor to take into account that might be of importance is that the demographics of who voted for Leave and who voted for Remain, the general... Now, it's not every single... Every single person who voted, obviously, this is a, a general trend, was that the elderly and the uh, un not uneducated, less educated, tended to vote leave. And the younger and more educated popula uh, populace tended to vote remain. Now, the problem with the older population is that uh, they can make decisions that would affect the future of the country, but then proceed to not survive long enough to see those decisions through. Whereas the younger generations have a tendency to increase somewhat over time. Basically what I'm saying is that it's estimated that the percentage of the elderly who have died that would have voted to leave the EU, assuming everybody else, everyone else voted the same, that that percentage of the elderly population who have died has been replaced by the, the younger generations who were not old enough to vote in 2016, but would be eligible to vote now. Now, if everybody else voted exactly the same way, it is estimated, estimated, will pronounce some of these words correctly, damn it, it is estimated that that uh, influx of new blood would sway the vote in the opposite direction. So that, that is also one of the reasons why I suspect that in the event of a second referendum, a third, let me, rephrase, let me rephrase, the event of a third EU referendum, the results would go the opposite way, as well as there being concepts such as Brexit fatigue, where people are just sick of the damn thing, as if new information has been brought forth. Uh, and obviously the people who thought it was a good idea in the first place. Whether that would push it beyond a 60% majority? I couldn't say. I honestly couldn't say. It's, there's, the only way, there's only one way of ever knowing what the majority think. And nobody who voted leave actually wants another referendum. They're fighting it tooth and nail. As I said, as are politicians who... Uh, as we've established, don't want to admit personal political failure by asking for a second referendum. Not to say there aren't politicians who are pushing it, and I much respect that, but people who, you know, quote-unquote, won the previous referendum, they don't want another one. But unfortunately, there's no real... As far as I can see, again, this is one of the areas for debate that I would love to, to have people discuss in the comments, assuming any of you poor souls have sat through all of this. But I fail to see a logical reason for a Leave voter to object to another referendum. Because either they believe in the will of the people, and they believe the will of the people hasn't changed, and thus a second ref uh, Sorry, I keep saying second, because people keep calling it the second referendum, despite it would be the third. Um, but they believe that the opinion hasn't changed. A third referendum would then reflect that the will of the people hadn't changed, and thus they have absolutely nothing to worry about with another referendum. It will be in the interests of the people, and their interests would align with the will of the people. Now, if they believe, such as myself, that the will of the people has changed to the opposite situation, in that now the majority wish to stay... I'll get my terminology right. If they believe that the majority have now chosen to... Uh, I say I'll get my terminology, terminology right, and immediately get my terminology wrong. Let's try this one more bloody time. 
This is what I get for recording after a day at work at 20 to 11 at night. If they believe the will of the people has changed to now wishing to stay in the EU, and they're still pushing to, to leave the EU, then they are actively working against the will of the people that they have found so important for the last three years. Now, it could just be that they do not want a second or a third, they do not want a third referendum, simply because they believe they will lose, and, you know, it's understandable if the politicians are doing what you want them to, it can be very hard to uh, put yourself in a position where you believe the politicians are only going to stop doing the thing that you personally want them to do. But as we've said, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And if you believe that the many have the opposite stance to the one that you have, then what is your argument for proceeding along the path that you have chosen? Uh, as you said, just because it is something that you want doesn't necessarily mean that it is what the people want. And if it's not what the people want, then Parliament shouldn't be doing it. I mean, I know that their role is not to follow the people, but to govern them. But in governing the people, the people have selected them to govern them. There's a lot of thems in this sentence. <laughs> but if, uh, if they have been selected by the people to govern the people, then the decisions they make involving governing the people should reflect the will of the people to the best of their ability. They should reflect the will of the people's decisions. That sounded like a sentence in my head. I'm not convinced it came out as one. I guess I'll have to see in the edit on that one. Um, believe it or not, I have been trying to edit this as I've been talking, sort of going over and deleting bits that are absolute gibberish. And yet we've been left with this verbal, just constant noise. I said, if you've sat through all of this, you have my utmost respect and my deepest and most sincere apologies. This is, as I said, majoritively me yelling into the void. But I am very interested in 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 debates, in, in having discussions around subjects, and I quite enjoy the idea of having my personal opinion changed by new new facts and new um, understandings of the world and seeing things from different uh, different perceptions. I suspect one of my biggest character flaws, and I am well aware that I have many, but I have a feeling that one of my biggest ones is I do have a tendency to try and make things into discussions and debates that people have no interest in debating. So, as an example, if someone were to turn up and say, oh, well, customer X did Y at work today, I'm well aware that I have a bad habit of trying to look at customer X's position and trying to think, well, why would they have done Y? And trying to make a discussion about it and say, well, if they did Y because of Z, then, you know, it makes perfect sense that they would do Y. And typically, if people are coming in to complain about customer X, it's not because they want someone to agree with customer X. They want someone to say, yes, customer X is being a dick. Don't let them do that. They're bad people. Let's let's enjoy our moral superiority over customer X. Uh, so I, I, that is a bad habit I have. And I do occasionally get on top of it, but I do majoritively end up accidentally angering people by not being on their side about things that the only reason they brought it up was because they wanted someone to be on their side about it. <laughs> yeah. This is completely off topic, by the way, but I do remember a specific example in which... Um, uh, a friend of mine was. Uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fluff the the details um, because I, I, it's, it's not fair of me to uh, to, <laughs> to out their actions, as it were. Um, but essentially, they did uh, an action in the name of feminism, which I, I'm fully in support of equality. I have no objection to uh, you know women having equal rights. The fact that they don't have uh, equality is baffling to me in many regards. Um, but no, they, they did an action um, in the name of feminism and it wasn't anything major um, but I looked upon that action 
and I disagreed with their reasoning behind it. I understood where they were coming from with this, but decided thought that the action itself was incredibly petty and in some ways demeaned their argument uh, or, or the the moral standpoint of their argument by you know the action that they had chosen to do. And they they got very angry at me for that. And they brought up all sorts of, of things. Now, as I said, I was seeing this uh, action in isolation. And they were seeing this action as part of um, many other actions that they had to deal with uh, on a day-to-day day basis. Um, not necessarily from that particular um, situation. It was things like, um, you know, getting catcalled and honking from vans and um, being singled out in groups to... You know, have to have to leave the group to go get sandwiches, for example, and single out because they're the only female of the group, so they miss out on the discussion. You know, things like that. So they were seeing this in the context of the wider picture, and I was only seeing the the singular incident on its own. So yes, yeah, so they they were were not happy with me about my uh, decision. I still hold that the the actions they chose were 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 petty in results to what they they actually did, which as I'm not going to discuss. But the end result was actually quite amusing. They ended up saying that uh, that my opinions on on uh, feminism didn't matter because of my gender. And I think if my gender rules me out of gender debates, there's something I said inertly ironic about that. And as I said, it was mainly stemming from a place of anger by the fact that you know they they hadn't come here for a debate; they'd come to to just talk about how much of a dick person X was being. And I decided to side with person X, but you know. So yes, I'm well aware that uh, that is a flaw of mine. But it's because I just enjoy discussions so much. I do enjoy, you know, trying to see things from a new perspective. And as I said, if I can get, if someone can change my opinion on a fact, uh, on a uh, on an issue uh, by the strength of their arguments, I love that idea. I love to have my horizons expanded and my views to change. So. That's, that's basically what all of this was an exercise in, just getting my voice out there, sparking a debate where possible, and saying that I believe that it is in the people's best interest to have a third referendum so we can finally settle the matter of is it in the people's interest to stay in the EU or leave it? You know, I probably could have summed this entire video up in a five-minute segment of just saying Brexit is a bad idea. That's why I named the video. I should I should have just said that like five times, and well, that would have been it. Would have been done. You wouldn't have had to have put through, <laughs> sat through all of this. My God, have I really been rambling for an hour? I really am turning into near rambler. That, that's all that's happening now. <laughs> I'm sort of gradually stealing all of his ideas and his his style, and just jabbering away into a microphone. Okay. As I've said, I'm sorry if you've sat through all of that. Thank you for sitting all that. And please put your comments in the uh, put your comments in the comments. Yeah, that's how that works. But put your opinions in the comments. Give me give me some arguments for why we shouldn't have a a, a third referendum. Because I've yet I've seen a few people arguing that it would be undemocratic, which is absurd. How can it be undemocratic to democratically ask the people what they want? So yes, please enlighten me. While I would usually end these videos just with a very abrupt by when I'm dealing with with heavier issues like the, the potential disaster that is the future of our country, I feel that I, I shouldn't end with just the abrupt by. I should end it with something a little more sincere. Uh, so thank you very much for watching any of this video. Thank you very much for, uh, preemptively thank you very much for any comments you have on the situation. And I'm sorry I have wasted so much of your time. Let's hope that it is not completely in vain and that something positive can come from all of this. And if there is no third referendum and we go through with Brexit, which, as I've said, I feel would be a bad idea, but is the most likely situation to go in. I sincerely hope that 
it does end up being in our country's best interest. I would love to be wrong about this. I, I would love for Brexit to occur and within 10 years for the UK to be stronger than it's ever been. That would be absolutely phenomenal. I would love to be wrong. I just don't think I am. But of course, if I thought I was wrong, then I would change my mind. So it's a bit of an oxymoron there. No one thinks that they're wrong about an issue. <laughs> okay. So, Brexit. Good or bad idea? Discuss. Thank you again. Good night. <laughs>